Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to proceed with our next speaker. And it gives me great uh, pleasure to introduce Martin Hayden to you. Um, uh, Martin will be talking to us about the power of the X chromosome. And he is from County Kildare. He's from uh, the border of Kildare, Leash and Carlow uh, in a place called Castle Dermot. And 14 of his 16 great-great-grandparents are from Castle Dermot. So if you put Martin into a juicer, you'd get the purest form of Castle Dermot DNA known to man. Not recommended, just an observation. Um, so Martin is a member of ISOG, the Irish Genealogical Research Society, and uh, the Irish Railway Record Society, but he works uh, by day as a principal analyst and modeler for Transport for London. But his night job is sitting in front of his computer and dabbling with genetic genealogy, and there's no better person to talk to us about. The power of the X chromosome, please give him a warm welcome. Well, firstly, I'd um, just like to say thank you very much to Morrison for inviting me to come and speak today. And um, I have to say, this is the first time I've spoken at a genealogy conference, so hopefully it all goes well. But um, I just thought I'd give a little bit of an overview of what we're going to look at, and then a little bit just about me as my first time out. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do um, a little bit of an overview on the DNA. So before I get into the X chromosome, I will, I know it's been touched in other lectures, but I will touch a little bit on autosomal, on Y, and on mitochondrial. Um, and I'll talk about the importance of um, DNA testing and traditional genealogy because they don't exist in isolation. We need both the paper records and the, and the other type of records to work alongside the DNA. And um, Martin's previous talk is evidence of, of how that can come together. Um, I'll introduce the X chromosome. I will give a talk a little bit about the inheritance patterns of X, which are, are quite different. And X has been neglected quite a lot, so I think it's quite nice to focus a little bit on X. And um, then DNA tests that facilitate cro X chromosome analysis. And I worked example of discovery. So I do have a tree in here. The names have all been changed to make it anonymous, but it, it is a real situation. But I have to protect the identities and that because there's an adoption and that involved in it. So it's only, it's only fair to, to change it. And um, a little bit about making DNA work for you and a conclu conclu conclusion. So me, I'm from um, the parish of Castle Dermot. I come from three miles outside the village. My um, parents are farmers. Um, currently living and working in England. And I was interested in genealogy from a teenager. I was lucky enough to remember my grandparents who passed away mostly in the 80s and the 90s. So when I was a child, they were able to tell me about the First World War and when they were children, let alone the Second World War. So I had first-hand experience of what life was like in 1910, 1912. My grandfather even told me that his, one of his earliest memories was the sinking of the Lusitania, and that was in 1915, and when it was on the papers and stuff like that. So it got me interested in history, and in school I did both Irish Leaving Cert, cert History and I did biology as well. So the history and the biology coming together was a good, a good way of doing um, genetic genealogy. And I did my first um, DNA test in January 2017, and now I've tested with everything and transferred into my heritage. And um, tested um, over 50, 20 members, and I've done quite a few big Y tests and mitochondrial tests as well. And I like to advocate for um, genealogy. And for those that might be seeing this on the, um, the web, that's why I'm okay. <laughs> so um, let's carry on. Um, I, run, I run a project, um, a small project called Castle Dermot DNA Connections. It's got 68 members now since that was put up. And um, about 20% um, of them are my family, essentially. And then um, the rest are, are, are other people that I've got through writing, searching people's trees. And if I find people in family tree DNA that have got an ancestor in Castle Dermot or whatever, I'll write to them and ask them if they're interested in joining the project. And I always try to give them something back. So I'll always try and research some ancestor for them in the records or um, 
go out and look at a grave or do something like that or get my mum to do it because I live in England so my mum just gets jobs. <coughs> but um, it's, it, it, I always feel that if they're giving me the access to the DNA, it's nice to give something back in return and then it's a kind of a two-way process and it encourages other people to get involved. Um, the project is combined, it covers autosome and XY and mitochondrial. And um, it's very useful because having grown up there, I've got a familiarity with the townslands. <coughs> Excuse me. And the townslands um, are very useful for finding families, especially if you've got many families with the same surname. You can say, oh, you're that branch of that family, or um, you're that branch of that family. Sorry. And... Um, one way, I, as one way, I contribute to the genealogy community outside my own personal family research. <coughs> Sorry. Now, and I also run. I have another little private project that I run to assist people on a genealogy on, on a basis, and that's across both England and Ireland. So, a little tiny bit then on just what are our aims and objectives in genealogy to make new family discoveries find new cousins. I found loads all across America, so I could have a holiday in every state now. <laughs> um, from Alaska to Florida to California to Utah to everywhere. Um, construct an accurate genealogy for future generations. I think we're a generation um, of people who have got a lot of older people and everything that's told us stories that can start to get lost as people start to move around. As Morris said, at the start, that my family have been in the parish of Castle Dartmouth and in South Kildare for a long time, a good, a good number of the branches of it. But people are, now I live in England, so people are starting to move more than they did. And I think it's getting that genealogy together while we still have got the information and trying to build it back and, and, and preserving it for future generations. Finding new cousins and, and developing a pedigree over many generations, and I'm back on the most part to my third great-grandparents and a couple, I've got, I think, eight fourth great-grandparents, so going into the late 1700s, answers the question of who am I and where do I come from and um, help on earth genealogical in info. And I think one of the biggest things for me is pr I like preservation and it's preserving our genealogical history. So um, for me, a lot of it is kind of preserving and trying to make things that future generations would be able to get. So, genetic genealogy. Um, the use of DNA to match close and distant color cousins we can, we can get. And then it gives us information about our admixture. Now, for me, it's quite boring because it's British and Irish all the way through, nearly. I don't have anything, anything exciting. Um, but... It is good in terms of ethnicity to give us an idea of what our ethnicity is. But as I say, a lot of the work I do is looking at the cousin matching and looking how we match. But it does give us an idea of if you have something that's different in there, it's another branch to follow and it opens up a new area of excitement or of, of a different genealogy than you might have otherwise thought. So in terms of ethnicity, I don't focus too much on the accuracy but if you've got something that's a high proportion of Asian or African or something else, Native American, it gives you something else to look at. And um, it also gives us more about our deep ancestry on um, Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA. So before I get into the X chromosome, I just thought I'd recap on a little bit about the autosomal Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA. As um, was mentioned on some other talks, the first 22 pairs of chromosomes um, are the, our autosomal DNA. So we've got, I know like 23 and me talks about our 23, but we're really 46 because it's one from each parent. Um, um, we include the X chromosome on the 23rd pair. It's male and female, and it's inherited from both parents. Y DNA is um, one of the sex determining chromosomes on the 23rd pair. So for females, it's XX, and for males, it's XY. And the Y chromosome has the um, SRY gene, and that's what turns on um, the, male, the male development and, and, and produces males from the XY. And it's the smallest, um, the smallest chromosome. Um, it's about 59,000 uh, <coughs> or million base pairs. 
So it's one of the smallest chromosomes. Um, I think 21 is the smallest autosomal, and then the Y is even smaller than that. And finally, the mitochondrial DNA, it's the power, or as I call it, the power station of the cell, if you like, and it's got this special type of, of inheritance patterns. While the Y DNA is on the male line only, the um, mitochondrial DNA follows the female line all of the way back. And um, Y DNA can only be taken by male testers, but um, mitochondrial can be passed down by male and female, but it only then goes to the next generation through daughters, through, through women, because it stays in the egg, so it's only come, passed through the egg, you see, so it doesn't, it doesn't go from, from sons to the next generation, it only goes from daughters to the next generation. So, um, autosomal DNA inheritance patterns is inherited the same way across all of the 22 autosomes. So every one of us get 22 pairs from our father and our mother. We've all 24 chromosomes in our standard autosomal DNA, and we're exactly half our parents. So when we talk about um, differences with siblings, it's because our siblings got a different bit of both our parents than we did, because it, unless we were exactly um, identical or monozygotic twins, um, every one of us are a bit different, whereas in that case, you're identical because you're coming from the, from the same single fertilized egg. And we therefore inherited a different proportion of our grandparents. And I think I've tested all of my siblings bar one, and um, it gives me a really good example of how I can say, right, I'm slightly more my maternal grandfather, whereas one of my brothers is definitely slightly more my, his, my paternal grandmother. And I can start from looking at cousins in the autosomal, how that's broken down. So just before we move on to the X part, here we are um, giving an example of the autosomal recombination. So up at the top here, um, we've got all of the great-great-grandparents, there's 16 of those. You can see that, how it's passed on to the great-grandparents, the grandparents, the parents, and then the rainbow stripes down at the bottom. Um, they, um, it, that's the reason why autosomal, though, becomes less useful after six, seven generations is because the stripes become narrower and narrower and narrower, and it's hard to determine and hard to break them out because... Um, and then all of a sudden you can start to have be missing parts from up here because maybe one of the great great grandmother's DNA got left behind somewhere here and it doesn't pass down. So, so that's one of the limitations of the autosomal. And the other graph is just showing the 22 autosomes and here we have the male with the XY and the female with the XX. So what is the X chromosome? So now we're on to the main part of, of this um, topic after doing a little bit of um, background. So there's the X chromosome up in the corner. <laughs> um, an X chromosome is one of the two sex determining chromosomes. 155 million base pairs. So we have 3 billion um, base pairs and the X chromosome is about 5.2% of, of our um, makeup. And it's similar in size to chromosome 7. So you can see the image from 23andMe shows the X chromosome here is quite long. And if you go to number 7, it's nearly the same size. So it's nearly the same size as chromosome number 7. And um, it was discovered in 1890 by a scientist in Germany. And it was called X because it was unusual. And actually, the Y chromosome was discovered a little bit later. And it was called Y because Y follows X. So, um, and um, it was considered unusual because meiosis in certain, in certain circumstances wasn't taking place. So it was proven that it wasn't, hadn't got the crossover. And that was in, 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 in the males. Um, there was no crossover with the Y, and that's why they, they, they discovered that it actually was slightly different in performance, and why there was something different about it than the, than the other chromosomes that were identified at that time. And females will have more X chromosome matches than males by virtue of having um, two X chromosomes. So um, we'll be able to um, look at that in a minute and how it come out. But one of the things that I find, the way nature works and the way mathematics works is kind of amazing, really. So, like, what 
does the X chromosome have in common with a sunflower, a Nautilus shell, and, and a galaxy Andromeda? That's our nearest galaxy. <laughs> um, well, it's because they follow, they follow the Fibonacci sequence of numbers, and so does the X chromosome. And the Fibonacci sequence is a, um, an Italian mathematician, and it works on that you're adding the number that you previously had before. So one and one is two, and two and three is five, and five and three is eight, and eight and five is 13, and so forth. I, when I was looking at this um, about six months or a year ago, I said, now I've got to work out how many X-inherited numbers I have in the different generations, um, because you've got two parents and four grandparents and eight great-grandparents and so forth. Well, I don't really have to think about it anymore because it works on the Fibonacci sequence, so it's very easy and quick to work out the inheritance pattern of the X chromosome. So, male inheritance chrom pattern here, and um, this has come from Blaine Bettinger. Um, I've taken the images, and he's got a very good book and a um, good website and um, loads of information, and that's where I do a lot of my background reading. And um, male inheritance, you can see you're starting at one and one, so you're female, and then it's two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one. So you're exactly going up on that through the Fibonacci sequence. And every one of those colors are where you can look to get your X um, chromosome. So like, for example, at your great-grandparent level, you can see um, they would come through my paternal, through my mum, through my grandfather, and then through um, my grandfather's mother, and then through my gr mother and grandmother, and then you would see I'm coming through both my grandmother's father and grandmother's mother. So you can see that with the X chromosome, you're narrowing down the possibilities to search. So rather than having the broad um, 16 great-great-grandparents, 32 great-great-greats, you're actually narrowing down the field. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more in a couple of minutes about how segments are passed on and how they can be quite long. And then the female um, gets the X chromosome from her dad as well. So again, you have this sequence. Now the Fibonacci sequence works on both sides of the three, so it's half and half. And um, when you're counting one on the male inheritance, you usually can count the one, if you like, from, from the mother, because there's um, only one and one. Whereas on a female, you can count from herself, because you've got one, two, and then you're going up, um, and you can count on each side. But you can see, therefore, that um, with, the, with the inheritance patterns, we have a much reduced field to work with than, than um, the full autosomal. And it gives us a more concentrated and targeted way to solve problems. And that's one of the things that this will demonstrate, is how I managed to do that. I think one thing that's important to mention, there's a lot, and sometimes it can be a mix-up with mitochondrial DNA, and xDNA. xDNA has numerous um, different inheritance patterns from, sorry, whereas the mitochondrial is only on the line of the female coming right back. So it's only the very pink line on the very edge of the male inheritance and female inheritance. That's your only line. Now, X chromosome um, has fewer inheritance possibilities than the um, full autosome, as you only inherit the X chromosome from female ancestors. And in my case, I inherit the X chromosome from my mum, and she X, X, um, inherits it from her parents, and I don't get anything in terms of X from my dad. So from my dad's side, I need to go to my sister. And um, I then inherit some X chromosome from both my maternal grandmother's parents, but only from my maternal grandfather's mother, and so on. And the unique pattern allows us to identify unique ancestral paths in our genealogical research. So, my mum and dad are made infamous. Um, you can see here, this is from Family Tree DNA, and my mum and dad, um, I've got an X match with my mum, as you can see, but I've got nothing from my father. So this is showing that the X match comes down. And here, um, I've shown just chromosome um, 22, um, and this is with... Um, my mum on the top and my dad on the bottom. And as you can see, I've got a full X chromosome from my mum and nothing from my father. And 
on the 23 and me the same 21, 22, and X from my mum, from my dad, X is blank. So um, they, that's showing basically the inheritance coming down. And one thing I'm going to touch on in a minute is you see there's a, um, a male here and a female there. That's because I've linked my family tree to me and to my mum and dad, which means my DNA is phased and that becomes relevant in a few minutes. So everywhere I look on the, the family tree DNA, wherever I've got a female, it means that they are related to me through my, through my mother. And everywhere I've got a male line, they're related to me through my father. And this is the importance of why we need to try and encourage people to put in a family tree into family tree DNA and link any cousins that we know to be related. So anybody in our lists that we've identified, if we can link them in um, to our tree, of course, those, they will remain private if they're living naturally. To, the, you, only we will see them, but then you can connect the DNA and it will phase it. And that becomes relevant to sorting this family mystery in a, in a couple of minutes. How having your data phased halves the work and halves the job because you know which side of the family you're dealing with. So, um, 23 and me. Um, then I was just going to mention a couple of little things about um, the um, chromosomes and. And 23andMe gives you a breakdown in ethnicity on the chromosomes, and you can see here is the, on the X that is saying that I'm largely um, Northwestern European, where a little bit of broadly European. Now, that's because I've used a tighter confidence level on this. You can set different confidence levels. If I went to a 90% confidence level, um, this is what I get. If I went back to a 50% confidence level, it's going to change the colour of this to being British and Irish because if you're less confident, you can give more accuracy. If you're more confident, the accuracy goes out <coughs> a little bit. But this again, when people are looking at the X chromosome, if they have tested with 23andMe, they can actually determine, especially if you've got any ancestry or ethnicity, that's of a broader spectrum, maybe from some Native American, African, Asian, you can see if that's coming through on the X chromosome, where, as you can see, all my family coming from Ireland, um, it stays blue. Um, but I thought it's just worth put, pointing that out. And one of the other things I wanted to just point out was um, DNA Painter. This is um, a tool by Johnny Powell, and he's given him uh, a talk at 3.30 today, and it's an excellent tool. And it's, it's invaluable in how to try and match these segments. And from um, Martin's talk earlier about going back and trying to match these segments from 18.30 and 1820, I have on my, tr on my one, there's a little yellow one here that's a known fourth cousin. So that part is from my great, great, great grandparents, that little bit there. And again, I put that in because you can see on the X chromosome where different segments are coming from. And I can tell you that that segment is coming from um, my maternal great-grandfather, and that's coming from my maternal, uh, my mum's great-grand, my mum's grandmother. So that's on my mum's grandmother, and that's my mum's um, grandfather, grandfather, yeah. So you can actually, from the segments here, start to determine where you're matching with, with the X chromosome. And then if you paint in known matching cousins, you can try to see exactly where they're going to fit. So I would definitely recommend, um, if you haven't already, looking at DNA Painter. And on that, um, the closest relative I have in is um, a, my aunt and uncle. And I'm going to create another one taking my aunt and uncle out so I can get more information on more distant segments. So. X chromosome is used to narrow down complex um, cousin matching and identify particular lines of relationships. It's um, different from females and males, which we've seen a couple of minutes ago. Um, no recombination with X chromosome in males. Now that's very important because um, a female's paternal X chromosome is identical to that of her paternal grandmother because if it's coming through her father and he can't recombine the combined with the um, y, y chromosome, the father is passing on his mother's X chromosome intact. So a female's X chromosome is that from her paternal grandmother identically. So 
there will be a um, crossover and recombination from her great grandparents, but it's very useful because if you go back further generations and start to look at X, it means you can get very, very long segments. And that's what's, um, what's vital, where you might get um, shorter segments in the general autosomal if you've got something that's coming down from a, a male female male female pattern you can get very very long segments and that's something you should look out for um, with the x chromosome with your dna matches you should go back through and see have i got any really long um, x chromosome segments because that's very very interesting and do it's not advisable to use X matches where a segment is less than 7 centimorgans, even I would say 10 centimorgans. If it's very short, it probably is accidental. And because, like, there can be a certain amount of endogamy, especially in Irish rural communities where back to your fourth or fifth cousins you have people marrying that's actually your descendant from two different lines. Now, I haven't actually found that yet, but I'm sure that in my generation before the one I've got, it exists because I've got some matches with people that are married into the family rather than be my family so I said something went on back about maybe between 17 25 and 1800 in that area in that time to 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 give um, um, pedigree collapse but that's why it's not really worth looking at anything that's very short you're looking with X chromosome to look for long segments now um, so um, usage and sources Family Tree DNA offers a chromosome browser and an X chromosome. 23andMe offers a chromosome browser and the X chromosome as well. Ancestry doesn't provide any chromosome browser. It provides the X chromosome in raw data, so you need to transfer that, and you can transfer that into Family Tree DNA. Um, in order to transfer, you need to um, pay the $19 um, which unlocks the DNA and you can use then the um, chromosome browser and I will say down on the stand today there is a code that's unlock fee for nine dollars so if anybody is going to transfer into family tree and DNA now is the time to do it and get the nine dollar um, um, transfer fee which is very very cheap and my heritage has a chromosome browser but it doesn't actually do the X chromosome it only does the autosomes 1 to 22 so again, you need to transfer, and you can transfer into family tree DNA. Living DNA, it has the setup for it, but it's not quite there yet. So Living DNA is one of the newer testing companies. It's currently under development, and I should imagine it will eventually get there. But at the moment, you again have to um, uh, download the raw data. And the last thing I wanted to mention was, as well as family tree DNA, you can always transfer into GEDmatch. Now, I'm a little bit cautious with GEDmatch at the moment because of the fact it's been taken over by this new Verigen company and I'm very, very in for protecting people's DNA um, and all of these issues with law enforcement and stuff. So I'm beginning to open up to the fact that GEDmatch is probably going to be okay and that this company will take seriously those people whose choices are option opted out. But again, like was mentioned in, in, in an earlier presentation, we need to understand what we're doing with our data, the terms and conditions. Be ha make sure that the testers, especially if you're managing many testers like I do, that they, they know and are happy with what you're doing. So I would say GEDmatch, yes, but with caution, make sure you've looked at it and make sure you're comfortable before you do it. Um, and with Family Tree DNA, you can opt out of the law enforcement. It's in the, it's in the, it's in the matches as well. And I just think it's fair that we always mention um, that... Um, when you're transferring DNA from other companies that people are aware you know what you're doing and getting into. Now, so now this is the part where I'm going to explain how I use the X chromosome to sort out a little problem. Um, a match appeared in a family DNA kit that was a match, a, 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 a high match with the kit owner. And here we are, we've got a cousin, a second cousin to third cousin. 288, 218 centimorgans and 42 is the longest segment and an X match. I said earlier that um, if you have 
parents. And with the great thing with family tree DNA is you can phase against cousins. You don't have to have your parents in. If you've got a first, a sec down to second cousins, you can actually phase. And look, you see, I've got against this cousin, it's a man with a symbol, but it's got the female symbol. So I knew that this was on the female side. So that meant on the male side, I could discard all of that side of the tree. So from that little bit of phasing, you can scrap half of it already. So half the job is already there, there. And that's from putting in the tree and phasing the matches. So the importance of this match is high as it's just above um, 218 centimorgans. As the kit owner had an extensive tree with other testers, it phased his cousins in, so the, with the red female symbol. And I think that's extremely important to get that knowledge out that it makes it very useful for, for working with trees. So, the next step, I looked at the chromosome browser and it showed a very high X match. Look, 218 centimorgans. And now we've got 128 on the X chromosome alone. Now, this definitely is something to start getting interested in, interested in because the others are, I couldn't show all the chromosomes on the screen, but going through, there's little bits of segments going all the way back up to, to one. But on the X, I just said, wow, look at that. That's absolutely massive. Um, so this is the part where I kind of worked through the example of how, it, how, how I worked it out. As I say, the names are all changed, um, but the um, outcome is the same. So we've got a family tree, and down at the bottom, we've got a load of people with DNA symbols beside them. So we've got this Smith family, and we've got this Baker family. And as you can see, the Smith family have done DNA testing, and the Baker family have done DNA testing. And they all are descendants from um, Georgina Clark and John Baker up here. Yeah. So then what happens? We get our new cousin appears with the 218 centimorgans. The 218 centimorgans is matching with Anna <coughs> Smith. That's where the match is um, with this person here. So we're saying, right, this new cousin, how do they relate? Um, because they haven't got any information and they don't know how they relate to this person because they contacted, um, and it's in one of my research projects, and they were adopted, so they don't know how they managed to fit in. So, right, the first thing I needed to look at was what are the lines of, um, uh, um, that, he, that, that the new cousin could match on? So firstly, from Anne Smith, I went up and I said, right, Joseph Smith, I've ignored. Why have I ignored him? I've ignored him because there was a female symbol from the phasing of the data. So I said, right, I can discard that side of the tree. The, the, it's definitely with, with, on this side. And because the segments were long enough, I was quite confident then that this was definitely on this side. So I looked at the possible um, family tree coming down from um, Michael Clark and Ann Miller and James Baker and um, Anastasia Cartwright. So I said, they're all of the um, descendants coming down, right? Um, so if I then went along and had a look and said, right, well, we've got these cousins, these first cousins of Ann um, Smith over here. These are the first cousins. Right, so they're also descendant of um, these um, um, up at the very top of the tree. So that was starting to um, make me think, right, this new cousin has got to be a descendant of either um, Michael Clark or Ann Miller or James Baker or Anastasia Cartwright. And I can make that assumption at that level because of the level of DNA being a second cousin at 218 centimorgans. So it's not really going to go much further back. So the next thing, ah, the new cousin got some information and found the mother's name was Clark. So, haha. We then start to look here and we say, right, so we've got Michael Clark and Anna Miller. So down we come. So I put in a few more siblings for Georgina Clark in here, Michael Clark and Annabelle Clark. And then we've got some um, unknown um, um, Clark here. The two represents two generations. There's two generations needs to fit in here to put them in the right place. And then we say, all oh, right, so we can place the cousin in here because we can see the clock coming down. But life is never that simple. The problem solved. The new cousin is descended from my clerk and Anna Miller. Well, maybe not. 
The problem was the xDNA only matched with those Smith cousins. So look, we have the Bakers, DNA match, nothing. Smith, X match, nothing, nothing. And here is the one we've seen earlier, that 218 with the 42. So I said, hmm, there's something wrong there. So if we go back a couple of slides, that means that all of these guys are not um, passing the X down. So if I go back up here and have a look, right, that means then that the DNA from here, from Georgina Clark, would come down to these. So it can't really be the X DNA from John, from Georgina. It must be from John, because here we've got Anne Baker receiving her X DNA from her father, but we have um, James Baker over here not receiving the X DNA from her from the father because he's got the Y from. So then it made me go back and think, hmm, right, we've got a new little problem here to solve. So let's see where we do. I went and looked at the X inheritance from Georgina Clark. So from Georgina coming down, <coughs> we've got all of these here. And so they would match with the X. You know, it's that um, Martin Baker over at the edge. He's not got it because he's not got the um, um, X chromosome from the father, from James Baker. So it gives you a little bit of a limit, but you can see, hmm, that's a problem. Um, if it was from the Clarks, um, they would have the X match. So let's go on another little bit. Right. The X chromosome from John Baker, he passes the DNA to his daughters from his first and second marriage. So here we've got the focus of the X now has got to be through um, John Baker and from his mother, um, Anastasia Cartwright. So down to Ann Baker and look, the Smiths families, again, they have got the, um, the X DNA in here. But if it's coming from here, that's correct. The Bakers over here that we saw in the last slide with the three of them having, those three not having any X, is exactly as we would expect. But John Baker um, had two wives because his first wife died after um, about 20 years of marriage and then he married Georgina Clark. So from his first wife, Elizabeth Chandler, well, they had some children. And of course, Isabel Baker and Elizabeth Baker are a half-sister of Ann Baker. So they would therefore be carrying the X chromosome down of John Baker, Isabel and Elizabeth Baker. Now, Elizabeth Baker, we know, went to the United States and um, her husband um, died tragically young. So they did not have any children and um, there's no record of, 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 of any of the children. And she lived to be 91 years of age. So we knew that there was no children there. So look at here. Clark. Isabel Baker married a Clark, just like Georgina's name up here. And that was what threw the research out for a month or two um, until I really started one Sunday morning starting to re-examine the whole DNA because we were assuming because the Clark was here that it was going back through Georgina Clark. And you see, this is where you might think, oh, the surname is going to actually give me the answer. This is where I want to look, and it isn't at all. There's a lot of names in Ireland um, where basically you have loads of people mar marrying. Like on my great, great, great grandparents' level, I've got a Nolan marrying a Nolan. Neither of them are related, but there's a Nolan marrying a Nolan. So um, you can see where, um, where you end up with this kind of thing that can throw you out and distract you a bit. So, we're nearly getting to the uh, um, end of how this little mystery was solved. So the new cousin descends from James Clark and Isabel Baker. And further matching with descendants from James Baker and Anastasia Cartwright confirms this hypothesis because I couldn't have a tree to go all the way across the whole room bringing in American cousins, um, numerous American cousins and everything. But I was able to do a little bit further, more research on this to confirm. So you can see then that the match with Anne Smith and, the, and, 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 and um, Neil Smith, which is on this line, 
which were shown as the two Smiths, they are actually matching um, with um, Isabel Baker and then coming down from the Clark line here. So from here, I do know which one of these it is, but I'm not going to go into that because, as I say, um, it's, it's um, better to, to um, leave it because um, at this line um, here, then when we get into the one, there, that person is still living. So that person is the mother of the new cousin. But we now know who the new cousin's grandparents are, great-grandparents, great-great-great-great-great, back up, and we know exactly how that cousin um, relates to Anne Smith. So that's just a kind of a little simple exercise on how the X chromosome has got a different inheritance pattern, how the um, how the X, how, how it's got a different inheritance pattern, and also how um, you can be misled by surnames, like because James Clark had the same name as Georgina Clark, and how you can end up being going down a blind alley. Um, but one of the big things to remember is the amount of DNA that Anne Smith has, because she got her DNA from her mother, but then she got her mother got it from her father, John, and she got a whole X chromosome coming down, unrecombined. So she got um, Anastasia Cartwright's DNA straight down, unchanged. And then there would have been some recombination here, but that still allowed for an Anastasia Cartwright piece of DNA all the way down because it didn't get recombined here. It was just passed on directly down through John Baker, right down to Anne Baker. So Anne Baker ends up with more or less the same X chromosome as Anastasia Cartwright because there's no recombination in the male. And that is why there's such a long segment. And the same thing happening coming down here. Anne Cartwright's essentially got the same DNA segment as Isabel Baker. Of course, um, and both of those should have a very similar, if not the same, because, as I say, there's no recombination. That's what's being passed over. And that's why, coming down here, even though you're going back up quite a few generations, you've got such a long segment. And I think that's, if there's one takeaway from the presentation, is to remember about how it goes through the male line unchanged. So you can get back, you can very quickly end up with large segments that are like 100, 100 years or more apart. And it really, it really brings it together. So um, I hope that part of the presentation is kind of giving you an idea. But I have two more slides that I just want to finish with. And that's about just DNA kits and profiles and good practice because I could not have solved any of this information if there wasn't trees there, if there wasn't um, some information in terms of phasing on the kits. Because if it was fa wasn't phased, I could have worked it out in the end, but I would have been working on the parental line of Anne Smith as well. So it would have doubled the work twice the length of time. And it really narrows it down. So. Um, what I recommend to everyone is create um, a pedigree tree back as far as possible. But I've invented, if someone else hasn't before me, so hopefully I'm not plagiarizing, the great-grandparents rule. And I think if people were to look at their trees and get to the great-grandparents and put in as much information as you can on that level, births, marriages, deaths, any information, newspaper articles, attach them all to the tree. And you, with having eight great-grandparents, it gives a lot of names, and most of them will be back before the 1911 census. Um, for example, my great-grandparents were born between 1858 and 1875, so quite a long time ago. And Sorry, 1880. 1858 to 1880. And that means that all of the information is searchable. So if you are looking for somebody, and you can at least have a tree with your great-grandparents going back or as much information. It gives people being able to, to look at that and look at public records as well. And then they can say, oh, one of their great-grandparents or one of their siblings is related to me. And it can give people an opening into how you might be related. And it, it covers for privacy for people who maybe their grandparents, if you like, are still alive and um, their parents, um, for people that are younger, if they don't want to put that information in for privacy of living relatives or maybe some relatives are not too happy. If you go back to the great-grandparents and do it, and of course doing it at the great-grandparents level, it gives you a wider um, 
number of names to work with as well, which always is, makes it um, better. And develop a tree further back, if possible, from your great-grandparents. And if for a privacy reason you cannot do uh, the above, please put a note on your profile inviting contacts to contact you. And I think probably everybody in this room does this, but it's other people. It's about us um, as genealogists helping other people that just do DNA tests. Maybe people just do DNA tests for ethnicity purposes or for interest sake. It's trying to get them to put some of the basic stuff in there. And I've with Ancestry try to explain to people how to link their basic tree and I've created little JEDCOMs and sent them to people to put on their site so they don't have to do anything, just upload a JEDCOM and it's there and uh, for people that I know and I just think doing that as genealogists we're going to help really make huge breakthroughs with DNA if we can get people to put in information. So great grandparents rule and the last one is use the great grandparents Alternatively, use the grandparents and it protects, connect your profile. True lines function then works correctly in Ancestry. If you get that in, you can get your true lines function starting to work in Ancestry. The smart matches in my heritage will work. Um, the phasing, especially in family tree DNA, and the great thing about family tree DNA is the fact that um, you can phase without your parents. You can use cousins. You can't use siblings, but an aunt or an uncle, first cousins, second cousins, first cousins once removed, are excellent for phasing. And the more you can put in, the more segments will be there, so the more phasing matches you will get. And um, enter the Ancestry info. Um, oh, that's the other thing I just wanted to mention. There's a beta function in Family Search, in Family in 23andMe, that connects to Family Search. And I spent all of my Christmas holidays, updating all of my family tree on Family Search and linking it into 23andMe. So it's now, a lot of people might not know it's there, but if you've got a 23andMe account, if you go in and find um, the, um, the link, you can turn on the beta. And then if you go into Family Search and put yourself into Family Search in an account and try and link it back to maybe if there's some tree there, or put a bit of a tree and link it into, fam into 23andMe, you can actually click and go directly into that tree for other people can click. And I think I've only got six matches that I've connected with a beta family, a beta for Family Search. But because Family Search, of course, is, is run by the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints, um, the Mormons in Utah, it's free. There's no charge for having a Family Search account. And it's one single global tree. So I definitely... For people that are not aware and have 23 tested with 23 and me, have a look at that feature in the beta. It's 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 really really good, and um, that is just a diagram to show um, where if you put in as much information on your great grandparents, how it's going to um, help you then follow solve many mysteries and work it through. And I've just put up um, a couple of references because. Um, the Family Tree Guide um, to DNA Testing and Genetic Genealogy by Blaine Bettinger. A great book. I've used it um, and a lot of chapters on xDNA, yDNA. Really good source to do. And um, then for people that have tested with Family Tree DNA, if you're not aware, there is a document you can download. I think it's about 42 pages long about genetic genealogy tests and Family Tree DNA. Um, so there's another book, and then there's um, an advanced genetic genealogy techniques and case studies. That's a very big book, a little bit more advanced, um, but Debbie Kennett in the audience down here has written one of the chapters, and it's really good for getting into more information. And again, here we have um, some, of the, um, some of the references, and then Johnny is speaking later on DNA Painter as well. So... Um, I think that is a nearly it. Thank you. Um, DNA, extremely valuable toolbox. X chromosome is often neglected. Careful, and re careful research and um, application of the X chromosome can break down walls and solve many family mysteries. And to use DNA effectively, accounts must be set up correctly. So I hope um, you like my little first time doing a, a presentation. <laughs> Thank you. That was a great overview of the power of X. Um, somebody came up to me the other day and said, I have a 90 centimorgan segment on the X chromosome and no autosomal DNA shared at all. Is that quite common? 
that can happen, yes, because what's happening is that it's coming down from even further back. But it, if that happens, it's normally a male, female, male, female, because it's break, there's only then recombination happening in every other generation. So if you get that, you probably want to say, right, the person's great-grandfather is probably coming on that line, and then it'll go back to their great-great-grandmother, and then it'll be their great-great-great-grandfather. Because for that to happen, it's thinking about it on the... If it was female, 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 it would recombine on every generation, and then it wouldn't be. So that's kind of given you a few tips of, if that happens, it's skipping the generations. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Well, you're going to be around for the rest of the conference. I'll, I'll be down at the family tree. I will be stand. down. Yeah. So if anybody has any questions for Martin about their X chromosome, please don't hesitate to contact him. We're running a little bit short of time, so we'll have to cut it there. Uh, but please give a warm thank you to Martin. Thank you.